Good morning, everyone. I'm Melanie Littlejohn, New York's Vice President for National Grids New York Business. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our 2021 economic forecast event. While we are virtual this morning, our goal for today, like any in every other year, um, is to share information and insight that will leave you with a clearer view of Central New York's economic outlook for the year ahead. For those of you who are following us on social media, we ask that you use hashtag CEO, CEO forecast. I wanna thank Rob Simpson and the entire team at Center State for hosting today's event and for their work in compiling the 2021 economic forecast report. The economic forecast report for Central New York is the cornerstone of this event. It brings together economic um, analysis and insight of the Center State members and the Central New York community, our leaders. Um, it examines trends across all industry sectors. The report can be found on the Center State uh, CEO website and will be shared with attendees following today's event. I want to extend our um, sincere appreciation to the forecasters who contributed to this year's report. Through both our annual surveys, as well as our in-depth interviews with research teams at Research and Market Strategies. We also thank RMS for their assistance in the development of this year's report. So coming up shortly, we're excited to once again be joined by MNT's bank, uh, regionals bank's econ <laughs> economist, uh, Mr. Gary Keith, uh, for our keynote address. We'll also hear from uh, Center State's uh, uh, CEO's president, Rob Simpson, with his perspective on opportunities and certainly the challenges that lie before us and our members' outlook as they continue to drive growth for their businesses and our region under such extraordinary circumstances. But first, I'd like to take a minute to thank this year's sponsors. Our presenting sponsors, uh, m and Bank and St. Joseph's Health. Our corporate sponsors, Dermody Bur Burke and Brown CPAs, Exelon Generation, Novellus, and Research Marketing Strategies. And our media sponsor, the Central New York Business Journal. I also wanna thank my colleagues, the Center State Executive Committee and Board of Directors for their dedication and leadership. And without whom this work would not be possible. Their engagement and commitment to our mission and work has absolutely never been stronger. We are fortunate to have strong leadership in our elected officials across the region. At no point in recent history has their collaboration been more important than during this pandemic. Their support, be it through their leadership, advocacy, financial support enables our work to take shape in this community. And so I'd like to take, take a moment to thank our federal, state, and local representatives for their ongoing partnership. Leadership at the state level is critical as we continue to, to face, oh, the economic and health crisis caused by COVID-19 and look to new programs and policies to support the recovery. To share more about the state's vision for driving progress this year, we welcome Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hopel, who will share this message. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hopel, and it's great to join my friends again at Center State CEO. I wanna first thank Rob Simpson, CEO and President of Center State, for his partnership as we continue this fight in the pandemic together. You know, the world was a very different place when I spoke at your last economic forecast breakfast in January of 2020. We were gathered in a large room, we shook each other's hands, we sat at crowded tables together, and the forecast I gave was filled with optimism and good news on the horizon. 
and then we were ambushed by COVID in the spring and our world changed forever. Experts said we couldn't slow the spread. We had to put a pause on the entire regional economies and industries literally stopping the hard fought progress overnight. And I've appreciated the opportunity many times to this, this to engage with all of you at Center State, keep you updated on the latest development. But here's one thing, we did slow the spread. We went from being the global epicenter of this pandemic to having one of the lowest infection rates among 50 states. It's a truly remarkable story of our resilience and perseverance. Many of you have been on the front lines in our war against COVID and leading the response in central New York in coordination with very various businesses and industries. Some actually kept alive with state dollars to start manufacturing PPE or through Nourish New York, which kept struggling farms and dairies on life support. We couldn't fight this war without you. And it takes all of us to do our part. And I want to thank you for remaining tough and stepping up. As chair of the statewide regional economic development councils, I look forward to working with you to formulate plans and reimagine a brighter future for Central New York. I've been in nonstop communication with healthcare experts, elected officials, business and labor leaders across the state. We're also working hard to get as many shots in the arms as many quickly and safely and equitably as possible. Despite the lack of a steady and adequate supply of the vaccine from the federal government, we are ramping up our distribution of the vaccine everywhere. We've vaccinated over 1 million New Yorkers thus far, and I'm proud to have launched several New York State mass vaccination sites, including one right here at the New York State Expo Center in Syracuse. So this is good news. Yet at the same time, we know we need to jumpstart our economy. We know a shutdown is not sustainable. This month, Governor Cuomo laid out a bold vision with his state of the state to reopen the state both safely and effectively. Ramping up rapid testing capacity is a key tool to make this happen. Our pilot testing programs to allow fans back at Buffalo Bills games were a great success. And we hope to adapt that testing program elsewhere to help businesses resume operations safely at venues like the Landmark Theater so we can bring back arts and entertainment to downtowns. Looking ahead, we'll continue to scale up the availability of testing to help businesses safely to reduce capacity restrictions. And we'll work with local governments to cut through any red tape to set up this critical infrastructure quickly. Within our new network of rapid testing locations, we want a customer to be able to stop into a new rapid testing facility, get tested, then 15 minutes later be cleared for a dinner or a movie. As we ramp up testing, Governor Cuomo and I also know that reconstruction needs to start now. Whether it's for travel or tourism or commerce, Infrastructure is fundamental for our economy. That's why the governor released a $306 billion infrastructure plan, the largest in the nation, to invest in the future of our state. We will repair and rebuild our roads and highways, including replacing the Syracuse I-81 viaduct. We'll continue to build on our $200 million investment to modernize our upstate airports. The governor also introduced the budget for the upcoming year. We do not regret saving lives ahead of all else, but the reality is that this has been very costly. Instead of financing this war, Washington so far has largely placed the financial burden on state and local governments. And now we need $15 billion from the federal government to avoid destabilizing cuts, tax hikes, and borrowing. We believe that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and the Biden administration will deliver on making sure that New York receives its fair share in state and local funding. If we do, we are focused on providing relief to business owners in New York through a statewide program, $130 million of pandemic recovery and restart program. That includes $50 million in small business rehiring credit and a $50 million credit for restaurants. Organizations like Center State CEO are invaluable resources in helping us form productive policy ideas as we start our reconstruction. I know how important the relationship is between our local stakeholders on the ground and state government. I also know that what's going to fuel much of our recovery, our reconstruction, is a sense of optimism from leaders like you. We need to guide this hard hit community to a post COVID economy that is stronger and even more vibrant than before. Sounds impossible? Well, 
Upstaters went up and down, and I know it because I'm from Buffalo. Neither the governor nor I are willing to allow the progress we made in places like Syracuse and Central New York to be lost. Through collaboration between our REDC and Center State, we worked too hard and came too far. So as we leap into this new year, eyes wide open to the challenges, but with hearts and heads filled with the can-do spirit that is in our DNA as New Yorkers. So I wanna thank you for your partnership and support through this difficult time. I visited Central New York many times since COVID to check on our businesses and participate in various groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings, all properly social distanced, of course, but it's clearly not the same. I miss the celebratory smiles, handshakes, and even the hugs that used to accompany these milestones in our community. But last week, we all witnessed as a new day dawned in our country with a glorious orange sunrise. Who knows, perhaps it has something to do with having an SU alum in the White House. We will defeat COVID, we will jumpstart Central New York's economy, and we will bring more economic opportunity right to this community, and Center State and New York State will lead the way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Hochul. Um, today's event certainly would not be possible without the steadfast commitment of our sponsors. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Philip Falcone, Chief Medical Officer at St. St. Joseph's Health, uh, a presenting sponsor for today's event to say a few words. Dr. Falcone. Thank you, Melanie. And thank you to our friends at Center State CEO for your continued partnership over the years. St. Joseph's Health is once again proud to be a presenting sponsor for this morning's event. What a difference one year can make. And I'm not just talking about the shift from being in person to speaking virtually. I continue to be awed by the resilience shown by this region, this state, and this community. Last year was one of tremendous challenges, some of which we are still confronting. I am so very proud of the team at St. Joseph's Health and across our entire healthcare community for the steadfast determination and teamwork they have demonstrated day in and day out throughout this pandemic. But the challenges, the uncertainty about the future and the long days didn't stop us. For the sixth straight year, St. Joseph's Health was recognized by US News and World Report as a best regional hospital. We were the only hospital in the region to receive a safety grade A from the LeapFrog group during the COVID-19 pandemic in both the spring and the fall. We were recognized as one of America's 50 best hospitals for cardiac surgery, vascular surgery as well by health grades in October and one of the nation's 50 top cardiovascular hospitals by Fortune, IBM, Watson Health in November. To receive recognition for the work we do is always affirming, but during a crisis, it becomes even more meaningful. These accolades in a year of such immense pressure and change gave us insight into our capabilities for navigating the remainder of the pandemic, as well as for the long term and we'll be an even stronger health system as a result of it. That's why we're here today, to usher in a new beginning, to talk about how we have evolved, how we have pivoted, and what that means for our region. The pandemic has tested our healthcare system, but St. Joseph's remained committed to finding ways to serve and care for this community. And by June, we were performing 200 to 300 telemedicine visits per day. While that significant of a shift is impressive, what I'm talking about is about more than adapting your business model. It's about resilience. Our staff cross-trained so they could be deployed where and when they were needed, allowing us to treat patients efficiently across the entire system. Work from home policies were implemented where possible and our colleagues quickly adapted to help keep everyone safe and healthy. Physicians, clinicians, and the patient access team came together to successfully restore elective surgeries in a safe environment while maintaining the highest quality standards. 
and we've acknowledged and thanked and rewarded our colleagues every chance that we've had. Like all of us, they are exhausted, but they are resilient. Flexibility, adaptability, and finding workable solutions are as important in healthcare as they are in any business. And the creativity we've seen in finding answers to complex problems is remarkable. Because of this outstanding work, St. Joseph's is the only large health system in central New York that has consistently stayed under the governor's established limit of 85% maximum capacity. I know this audience understands the gravity and importance of that statement. Staying under the shutdown capacity limit has economic implications for our community and the entire region. It means people can go to work. It means they can earn a living. It means keeping businesses open. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought healthcare to the front lines of our economy. The effect of having healthy employees, safe workplaces, and the link between health and economic security has never been so clear. We at St. Joseph's and we as a community have demonstrated that we are ready to meet the challenge. Innovation and continued investments in technology are allowing us to improve access to care as well as patient outcomes which benefits both the individual and the community. Our region's ability to recover, both physically and economically, is within reach. In record time, with global and regional teamwork, we have not one, but several vaccine alternatives. And I wanna take the opportunity to encourage everyone to please get the vaccine as soon as it becomes available to you. Keep wearing your masks, practice social distancing, and wash your hands frequently. These are the most important weapons in our fight against this pandemic. We can do remarkable things when we all pull together for the greater good of our community. Working together for our community is not simply an ideal, it is an imperative. We are fortunate to have partners like Center State CEO at our side, removing obstacles and building strong communities that are resilient to the challenges we face. I look forward to the advancements we will make in the year ahead as we emerge from this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Falcone for that um, powerful message. Thank you. We also couldn't host today's event without the support and leadership of MNT Bank. Therefore, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, MNT Bank's regional president Mr. Allen Naples to talk about their role in sharing relevant data-driven insight to support our region's progress and to, of course, introduce today's keynote presentation. Allen? Melanie, thank you very much. And on, and on behalf of M&T Bank, I would sincerely like to express our, our appreciation for all you do as the leader of National Grid and what National Grid does for this community because it's very, very important and I can't thank you enough. So with that, m and is once again, very proud to be back as presenting sponsor of today's event because we see tremendous value in sharing insights and the information from the region's businesses to better understand what they experience in their industry throughout the years. For several years, m and Bank has worked diligently with its clients, centers of influence, local and state and federal leaders to help put the regional forecast into a broader perspective. At no time in recent history has examining the ever-changing and important trends in the national economy been so critical. COVID-19 has touched every corner of our national economy. Examining the short and long-term effects of this pandemic, pandemic and utilizing data and analysis to better inform how our community adapts to the ebbs and flows of the economic cycle is the best way to plan for recovery. So once again, to share this year's insight and provide a detailed look at national state economic trends that impact our local economy, it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome my colleague, regional economist at M&T Bank, Mr. Gary Key. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I appreciate being here virtually today, uh, and I'm gratified by seeing how many participants we have, uh, well over 330 right now, which really 
I think is a testament to the value of this event every year and how well it is viewed as a means of understanding the challenges in the economy ahead of us, helping us to make better decisions as we go out through the year. Uh, today, we're going to follow the same path that we have in past years. We're going to take a look at the U.S. economy and then center state trends to hone in on what we can do as individuals and businesses and organizations to help drive that economic activity. Uh, we know there, there's never been a year like the last year, and we face enormous challenges still ahead of us, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. And so today, as we go through our presentation, we'll look at those challenges clear-eyed and sober, uh, knowing that we have a heavy lift still to get through this uh, pandemic. But I'm optimistic that we are going to get back on the path that we once were. And that's been one of the most uh, enjoyable aspects to me of participating in the last several years in this event is that we're able to show the progress that Center State has been making. Uh, and it was real solid progress that benefited our community. Uh, we've had this uh, bump in the road, if you will, uh, with the pandemic. Uh, but I think that it's important that uh, we get through this because we'll get right back on that path. I'm, I'm confident that we are making the progress we needed and we'll get to that uh, as soon as we can get the virus behind us. Well, let's jump to our first slide then and look at where we are nationally. Uh, and certainly the pandemic uh, struck a mighty blow to the US economy. We've never seen anything like it, in fact, in terms of a number of metrics and in terms of employment in this particular slide, you can see just the, the, the more than 100 year storm that we weathered here over the past year. Uh, the plunge that we took in April, uh, the rebound that we've seen since then, but still, it's sobering to some degree to think that the year-over-year -year job loss that we recorded in December is still lower than where we were at the lowest point of the Great Recession, which we thought uh, was a big event uh, a decade or so ago. Uh, uh, lo and behold, uh, we've seen quite a bit more stress on our labor markets in that intervening period with this uh, pandemic-related lockdown. Next slide. Let's hone in on some of that job picture uh, uh, more closely here. Uh, you can see the progress we've made since April. Uh, we have uh, rebounded, uh, recaptured three quarters of that loss, but the uh, worrisome sign is the slowdown that we've seen in the fourth quarter, uh, where we're not really ratcheting up that job growth uh, to the extent needed to close the gap that we opened back in the spring. Uh, the 6 million jobs that remain to be filled still are ahead of us. And we hope that uh, as the virus uh, is attacked with the vaccination program, that we can begin to close this gap. But right now it does represent a drag on US economic activity as we begin 2021. Next slide. When will the economy rebound? Well, that's a pretty easy one. You don't have to be an economist to really uh, give an answer to that particular question. Uh, when we can get back to doing the daily activities that all of us have, uh, mobility is the word. Uh, mobility is constrained uh, because of social distancing and other measures to fight the pandemic. Uh, the interesting slide here on the left side of the screen is a new index created by the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas that tries to capture that particular aspect. Uh, it's really interesting that it's a combination of cell phone tracking information. Uh, I don't want to say big brother, but it's an aggregate uh, masked uh, ability to look at where that cell phone uh, geolocation data is. And then what it's showing us is that after the spring uh, rebound, much like the job picture that we saw in our previous graph, uh, we have been moving sideways with mobility. There's a very strong correlation between mobility and GDP. Uh, folks going to work, folks shopping in person, uh, create economic activity. And when that's constrained, uh, you get the uh, slowdown in economic rebound that we are seeing. 
Another example is airline traffic. Just in uh, 2021 alone, we're seeing less traffic than a year ago uh, uh, to a, a large degree. Uh, the fact that people are reluctant to get on planes is, again, another sign that the economy is constrained. And uh, this will be with us until we get the vaccination program widespread. Until then, uh, headwinds for economic activity. Next slide. So the virus will determine the path of recovery. I think this is pretty clear that once we get a sense that the uh, normalcy of the various metrics we have around uh, public health is looking positive, we'll see the economy start to open up. Uh, how well we fight the uh, pandemic through our efforts to mask up and get vaccinated and roll that out efficiently will determine how soon we can get back in the saddle as far as the economy goes. And I think that's a, a clear given. And so it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we're doing the things necessary to help uh, move that needle downward in terms of uh, the pandemic spread. Fortunately, we're starting to get some sense that that's occurring now that we've moved past the holidays. Uh, hopefully it will continue into the spring. And uh, as we go to our next slide, we'll get a sense of what uh, economic forecasters are, are calling for in terms of getting back to growth. Uh, the expectation right now is that GDP will start to move into the positive side of the ledger somewhere around mid-year. Uh, this is a slightly different way of presenting GDP growth. It's year over year as opposed to on a quarterly annualized basis. We had the fourth quarter numbers uh, preliminarily come out this morning, uh, and they were spot on to the forecast. So uh, for the fourth quarter of 2020, uh, two and a half percent lower than a year ago in terms of total economic output. So we're on the path that is forecast for uh, seeing that growth resume around mid-year. That big jump in second quarter of 2021, I want to caution, it's not uh, that uh, the all clear is here. It's just a, a result of the year ago number being so tremendously small. The 9% loss that we saw in the second quarter of 2020 is reflected in that big upward movement. The other quarters of 2021, the third and fourth, really, I think, give a more reasonable picture of what economic activity is going to be for 2021. And uh, we're on the way. Uh, the, there's no guarantees, but the, the, the expectation right now is that we can start to look ahead and make decisions and plans that can uh, really uh, re-energize us as we go forward on a national basis. Next slide. So what does that mean for us here in the center state region? Uh, we are under that large umbrella of macroeconomic activity, but we have our own uh, issues and progress and ability to move the needle here. So let's take a look at our first slide here. And I want to reiterate uh, the fact before the pandemic hit, we were making real solid progress in terms of moving the center state region forward. Uh, real per capita personal income had been rising solidly for four consecutive years. Uh, and in fact, in 2019, we saw the best growth yet in terms of that uh, progress. Uh, better than Rochester, better than Buffalo, better than Albany, better than the United States in terms of putting real dollars into people's pockets. The economy was making progress. And that's what's frustrating about the pandemic. Uh, is that uh, we had to step back from that uh, for a moment uh, to get through that. Well, if we get back uh, to where we were, uh, this is the progress we can hopefully expect to re-energize coming out the other side of this pandemic. Next slide. Unfortunately, in the here and now, uh, we do have a headwind from uh, the COVID-19 impact. Uh, we see the impact on regional employment was severe, uh, 86,000 plus jobs lost uh, at the beginning. Uh, we've recaptured uh, 40,000 of those jobs, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, and fortunately, uh, on a relative basis, a little ways 
do farther to go than that national trend that we saw earlier. Uh, the annualized hit to consumer spending of $2 billion is significant and has to be worked through. Uh, hopefully, the sooner we can get the uh, virus controlled, the better, so we can whittle down that particular uh, hole in our economic and spending power. Next slide. As you might expect, the epicenter of those job losses are in consumer-focused, consumer-facing sectors, leisure, hospitality, retail trade, certainly taking it on the chin in terms of uh, the lockdown. And so it's gratifying that just yesterday uh, we heard about the removal of the yellow and orange uh, restrictions around many of these uh, organizations, particularly restaurants, uh, and they still have uh, a number of things that are uh, you know, blocking normalcy, 50% uh, occupancy, uh, 10 o'clock uh, curfew. But nevertheless, uh, I think moving in the right direction to take some of the pressure off of the employment losses in that particular sector. At the other end of this chart, uh, the financial activity sector, construction, manufacturing, uh, relatively modest losses compared. Uh, and we hope, again, that these will be the leading sectors coming out the other side of this event. Uh, the ability to have those uh, higher paying type industries uh, lead the way coming out will be very important. And I think we'll be seeing more of that as the uh, pandemic abates. Next slide. What about employment, you might say? Well, we've made good progress on the surface in terms of whittling down our unemployment numbers. Uh, clearly, from the high that we saw back in the spring to where we are now, uh, actually below the U.S. average, looks encouraging. Uh, it is encouraging from the standpoint that uh, that progress has been made but for a reason that is still uh, not ideal. And if we go to our next slide, we'll see why some of that progress has been made. And unfortunately, there are few people participating in the regional workforce. Uh, when that happens, the unemployment number is somewhat uh, masked by the fact that uh, people are dropping out, not looking. And we hope that uh, we can address folks that may be losing hope about the uh, workforce with some of, of the aid that uh, package that Washington is working on with some of the pandemic related unemployment benefits that are coming and other things because we certainly want to maintain people's hope and ability to participate in our workforce. Uh, the fact that we're seeing that downward pressure should make us roll up our sleeves and hopefully get our elected officials uh, even more motivated to make sure that we get this soon and not drag it out uh, further and further into the new year. Next slide. So we've faced some challenges. Uh, we've certainly had nothing in the past to be able to give us an idea of what the future might hold but we're gonna take a stab anyway. Uh, we wanna make sure that we couch this in terms of uh, the unknown is the unknown and uh, everything else that goes with that. But where do we go from here? Next slide. Well, good news in terms of uh, some of the trends that we're seeing gives me hope uh, and I hope everyone else that uh, we're coming down the other side of this perilous mountain that we've been on. Uh, how quickly can we roll out a vaccination program and how soon can we work down uh, the exposure and uh, hospitalization numbers uh, that we're seeing in our community? It appears we're making good progress in central New York from that peak, uh, a little less so far in the Mohawk Valley region. But nevertheless, uh, I expect this number to continue to come down. And this, again, will uh, permit mobility to resume. And it's a question of uh, the timing around this as we go forward, which uh, I think we can all hope uh, rolls out as efficiently as possible and uh, gets us back to uh, some sense of normalcy or, or probably around that mid-year uh, timeframe. Next slide. 
At the moment, though, uh, this is the sort of forecast that I think that we should work under for the first half of the year, uh, or at least the first quarter, if anything else. And it's, again, the mobility and engagement index from uh, the Dallas Fed. Uh, we saw the U.S. number previously. Well, the center state number is pretty much in the same category. Uh, we are moving sideways. Uh, we are seeing some volatility uh, towards the end of this period as uh, we uh, saw some of the holiday-related spikes and uh, terms of the virus. Uh, but as we get further into the year, if we can track this mobility as a proxy for uh, our uh, economy moving again, uh, this would be an indicator I think we need to keep very close attention paid to. Uh, right now, uh, we're not seeing enough of a lift to say that we've made it through, but uh, I expect this to start to change in the next several months as we get a, a uh, uh, concerted effort to get the vaccinations out and in arms. Next slide. So to reiterate again, uh, everything in the economic uh, recent history and near-term future has been predicated around uh, the COVID-19. Once we get past that though, we have to again, remember who we are and what we are achieving, uh, I think is a region in terms of the progress we are making. Uh, again, just to give you a sense on another measure here that uh, per capita real GDP had been improving for four consecutive years and had done quite well in 2019 relative to the rest of the country, uh, the rest of other uh, metropolitan areas. And that's the kind of progress that I think that we are going to be seeing uh, as we continue to roll up our sleeves do the work that we need to position our economy for the future. And so my message is in terms of, let's go to our next slide, uh, stay, the, stay the course, keep planning that work, keep uh, working that plan. Uh, the uh, regional plans that we had in place, we're bringing progress. Uh, I know sometimes it can be frustrating and fits and starts to see some of these plans uh, move in little different directions than we may have thought going in, but the important part is to keep working on this and to keep positioning Center State New York for the future. Uh, we saw the progress that we made, so we know it works, and that should steal us to uh, getting through the pandemic, getting back on track, making those plans work for us. And if I can finish up then with my last slide, uh, a little serendipity if you're here. Let's think about what we might be able to be uh, in the new world post-COVID. Uh, this is a survey that was done by a residential real estate firm, Redfin, who does much of their work online. And in the third quarter of 2020, uh, as you can see, searches on their platform from outside the Syracuse area we're coming from a number of metropolitan areas. So folks looking at central New York as perhaps an area to move and live in a world where remote work is gonna be with us, I think more in the future than it has been historically. I think we found things about work in this past year that are gonna reposition a lot of how the future looks from the standpoint, many people can work from anywhere now. Uh, if those folks are looking at central New York as a landing spot for that ability to work remotely, we need to be ready to capture some of that activity. We need to look at it as an affirmation that we have things to offer uh, the rest of the world in terms of our location and talent and ability to get things done here locally. And so I'm encouraged that uh, we have uh, made solid progress. We will continue to make solid progress. Uh, it's only a matter of time now before we get the pandemic behind us. Uh, we have to stay vigilant, uh, 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 diligently masking up and doing the things we need to do. But I encourage all of us to start thinking about this near-term future in a post-pandemic world and how we can capitalize on that for our organizations and households. And with that, that's my presentation today. I wish you all the best of luck in 2021, and we'll now pass it back to our moderator. Thank you.
Oh my God. Okay, I think I'm back. Uh, sorry about that, folks. I, uh, I got kicked with a little technical difficulties, um, but it is, uh, it's, great, uh, it's great to be here. So good morning, um, Gary, thank you very much. And let me start by saying thank you to St. Joseph's Health and to m and Bank. Year after year, you all support this event and our agenda for economic growth and shared prosperity in Central New York. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Um, I really can't say thank you enough. Uh, to all of our members and partners who've joined us today, thank you also. Um, the day that we resume these events in person will be a wonderful, joyous occasion. But for now, it's just nice to have these virtual spaces to be able to stay connected with one another and to share what's happening uh, in our region and in our businesses. And to our staff at Center State CEO, what you have accomplished this past year, despite difficult circumstances, um, and impossible odds really is nothing short of remarkable. And you have maintained our programming and our presence in the community. You've served more members than ever in a time of exceptional need. And you have supported your colleagues and your friends and your loved ones through sickness and hardship. And you did it all with kindness and grace, showing up for our community and each other in ways that I will never forget. And individually and collectively, you make this organization what it is. And for that, I thank you. As much as today is about reflecting on and putting into context the economic pressures and trends of the past year, it's also about laying the groundwork for how we approach the opportunities before us. For while this pandemic may have slowed us down and put some of our ambitions on pause, it cannot and will not stop us from achieving our vision for this region as a place where business thrives and all people prosper. First, the challenges. As Gary rightfully pointed out, there are real headwinds facing our economy. Most of these trends are not unique to central New York, but rather reflective of a national and international economy battered by a plague that is taking both life and the freedom of movement upon which a modern economy depends. Now that sentiment was echoed by our forecasters who shared the challenges they faced in 2020 and a much more muted sense of optimism especially compared to recent reports of what they see for 2021. 42% described their outlook for the strength of their business in 2021 as strong or very strong, down 34% from 2020. 44% expect sales or revenues to increase in 2021, down 26% from last year. 42% expect to expand products and services, down 18% from 2020. 39% expect an increase in jobs and hiring, down 26% from last year. And 34% expect to increase capital investments, down 15% from just 12 months ago. Now, these projections for the year are sobering and they reflect a sentiment that our region's business leaders have not felt in more than a decade and a half. They represent a clear reflection of the incredible stressors brought on by nearly a year of pandemic-driven uncertainty that has impacted every aspect of our lives. And yet, when I sat down to think about the message I wanted to deliver to you today, one that I hope you'll carry out of this virtual gathering and into your own conversations about what the future holds for this region, I found myself focusing not just on the data and the fundamentals, but on a broader narrative and civic arc. This is not the first time Syracuse and Central New York have faced difficult times. In fact, each of us who's called this place home for any measure of time can recount story after story of economic hardship or of civic ineffectiveness or of the sheer human impact of layoffs of our youth moving away or of entire communities like the 15th Ward demolished in an act of racial segregation and trauma. No, this region has faced tough times before. Vast 
multiple economic and demographic forces have aligned and worked against us in the not so distant past. And yet, yet, in February of this last year, this community was celebrating its greatest level of economic success that we had in decades. That is just one of the many reasons that while tired from the many tolls of this past year, I do not feel beaten. While disappointed, I haven't lost hope. And while some may say that we can't recreate the magic of this community's renaissance, I say, watch us. Let's not forget, this is not, as Gary said, a normal economic crisis. This is an economic crisis driven by a public health crisis, a once in a hundred year pandemic. And because this is a health driven crisis, we know that there is a clear way forward with hope in the form of vaccines and new treatments. And if we all do our part in the battle to defeat the virus, we wear our masks, we practice social distancing, and when it is our turn, get vaccinated, we will emerge from the other side. This is one very clear example of how the choices we make as individuals impact all of us and will dictate the pace at which we return to normal and accelerate our recovery. Add to that this new and unique moment for our region where an alignment of federal leadership with real ties to central New York might benefit this region in meaningful ways. A new president who lived on Tipperary Hill and graduated from Syracuse University. A Senate majority leader with ties to our region as well and whose presence here pre-pandemic was essentially ubiquitous. Federal leadership positioned to understand we need challenges of cities like Syracuse and support our efforts to help ourselves. Congressman Kako too is in a new leadership position that can be leveraged to our region's benefit and he continues to commit to working with other leaders across the aisle to make sure the work we need them to do gets done. We've seen the successes that follow when our local leaders cast aside political differences and fight not to be right or to win but to come to a shared vision and to move this community forward. But what makes me truly hopeful is my unwavering belief in our capacity to rewrite our future because we have done it before. This region watched for decades as jobs and people left. We've been written off far too many times to count and yet you didn't give up. Nope, instead you rolled up your sleeves and you dug in. You pressed your shoulder to the plow and drove headfirst into the challenges that were standing in the way of our ambitions. We have fought back before, and we will do it again. Think back to the trajectory this community was on at the beginning of 2020, when Gary Keith delivered what we called his most optimistic forecast ever. For years, Gary's been telling us that our economy was marked by its slow and steady growth. He stood before you one year ago and said, if we're to break that no boom, not much bust cycle, then we need to continue to lean into our strategies because they were sound and progress was being made. And you just heard him say that if we recommit to that approach, that those strategies will help drive us to a more prosperous and resilient recovery. When you look, the investments seeded over the past several years are taking root and becoming real. And just last week, you heard the mayor share the city's investments in smart cities and Syracuse surge initiatives, which were mere concepts a year ago, are moving forward and on the cusp of unlocking untold opportunities for innovation and public service delivery, traffic management and data analytics. They also will help to bridge the very real gaps in digital inclusion that have become even more obvious during this pandemic. Projects like the Salt City Market, which opens tomorrow, JMA Wireless and the STEAM School continue to move closer to reality. And we can beginning to see how these investments will be critical drivers of further growth. Each of these projects are tangible examples of our strategies in action, our intentional efforts to direct investments in the people and parts of our communities with untapped potential to better position them to be a part of our growth, ambitions, and greater prosperity. Taken together with the expansion of the Tech Garden, these very projects will be realized in the next 12 to 18 months, and they will transform our communities through job creation and further cement Syracuse as a hub of tech innovation. And a year ago, Amazon was just a name, whispered quietly as people guessed what company was behind the development project in Liverpool. How many of you have driven past that building lately? It's massive. 
And when seeing it firsthand, it's impossible not to also see the jobs that it will host and envision the follow-on development a project like that will create in this community. In Oswego County, we're seeing investments come to life as well. A DRI investment, Downtown Revitalization Initiative, of $10 million has leveraged an additional $96 million in private investment. And of the 12 projects these investments funded, all of them are either completed or under construction. Our focus on investing in livable communities is also paying off. Each year, more than 35,000 people move to the Syracuse metro area, and most of them are between 18 and 39 years old. A recent study from the National Association of Realtors that looked at all metros in the U.S. showed that nearly three out of four or 73% of recent movers to this area were millennials. Initiatives like Generation Next are working to ensure that we can better attract and retain this talent, as well as foster opportunities and career advancement for diverse talent within our region. We're also seeing this growth through real estate transactions as homes in Syracuse city neighborhoods sell almost as quickly as they come on the market. In August, the Greater Syracuse Association of Realtors reported that the one year change in median home price was up 17.2%. And while the number of new listings in August remained at pre-COVID-19 levels, the list price sellers received for those homes was over 100%. Now, we saw similar growth in downtown Syracuse last year when residential population grew by 7.5%. The most downtown's population has climbed in a single year since 2014. Over the last 10 years, downtown Syracuse has experienced an 88% surge in its population, a trend that is expected to continue as even more new housing comes out of the market. Now, this is incredible progress that began before the crisis and has only extended and continued throughout this pandemic as people look to migrate from larger cities to places with slightly less density, more affordability, and a greater quality of life. Does that story and that narrative sound familiar? Because it's the one we've been talking about for decades. And for those still doubting how quickly we can return to an economy where money circulates freely and people are back to work, how does a $2 billion infrastructure project starting in 22 sound as a potential stimulant? Finally, after years of debate, disagreement, and inertia, we have a preferred plan, the community grid, which includes many of the enhancements that Center State CEO has advocated for in this process. And we now have a target date for construction to start with heightened odds of the necessary federal funding to complete it. Now, our community's focus can and must shift to how best to maximize this opportunity and ensure that the community grid works for more people. Not only will it reshape our physical landscape and how people access our city, but it also provides an opportunity to make sure that the people in this community that need jobs have a clear pathway to those created by this project, particularly women and minorities. Efforts to ensure the local labor, labor force and contractors are well positioned to participate in this project are already underway. Center State CEO is working with Mayor Walsh and County Executive McMahon to develop and launch Syracuse Bill, the workforce initiative dedicated to developing career opportunities in construction related fields for Syracuse residents, particularly from low income communities and communities of color. As the economy begins to pick back up and with work on 81 in the horizon, Syracuse Build can and will produce a pipeline of qualified local workers for the Interstate 81 project. Now, every one of these projects and investments and the jobs they stand to bring provide hope for a stronger future. And this is just a sampling of what's happening in our region. There are other projects in the pipeline as well. Other reasons to believe that the future can and will be bright. And just in the first four weeks of the new year, the number of conversations we're having with businesses, with many of you, about new investment, expansions, and new jobs is picking back up, showing a renewed momentum and a reason for measured confidence. But while there are plenty of reasons to be hopeful for our economic recovery, recovery alone cannot suffice as our only ambition. While if this pandemic and a new season of reckoning on issues of racial and social justice has laid anything bare, it's the ever prevalent disparities between those traditionally positioned to benefit from economic opportunities and those that suffer and are left behind by the structures of our current socioeconomic systems. Before the pandemic, we were beginning to see slow progress when it comes 
to one of this community's most persistent challenges, poverty. Overall, poverty went down in the city from 2014 to 2019. And if you had a job, any kind of job, the chances that you were in poverty fell the most. Poverty rates are higher for the unemployed though. And from 2014 to 2019, it got worse. 53% of the unemployed were in poverty in 2019 compared to 50.7% in 2014. And of course, significant unemployment caused by the pandemic has only exacerbated this challenge. We see a large disparity in the fact that women, particularly women of color, lost their jobs during the pandemic. The women and men shared equally in the number of jobs in the workforce at the start of the year. Job loss for women in 2020 was 1 million more than for men. In a year where 9.8 million jobs were lost, women accounted for 55% of that loss. And this was due to significant job losses in many female dominated sectors like education and retail among others. Women also disproportionately stepped up to fill the gap in childcare and education for their families. Among women, these job losses were felt most significantly among Latinas who currently have the highest unemployment rate at 9.1%, followed by black women at 8.4% compared to white men who have an unemployment rate of 5.4. Now in December alone, 154,000 black women nationwide left the labor force. Recovering what we had just 12 short months ago would unquestionably feel good to many. But to so many others who live amongst us in this community, that notion of recovery, of going backwards, represents a return to a system that is broken, unfair, and unjust. So today I ask this of you, in solidarity, let us raise our aspirations for the year ahead beyond those of simple recovery to include a repair of our fractured social compact and a more equitable and inclusive approach to growth and development as we reinvent this region once again. We all have work to do to make this possible. And I'm proud that Center State CEO's Board of Directors stepped forward to prioritize issues of corporate responsibility for racial and economic justice as part of its 2020-21 Board Retreat strategic planning process. Companies are actively engaging in our diversity, equity, and including training services with our newly formed racial equity and social impact portfolio led by Dr. Jahana Rogers. Companies like Digital Hive, National Grid, SOS, KSNR, One Group, SRC, and so many others have begun to take tangible action steps and are investing in this work. The United Way, for its part, launched an incredible ongoing effort to expand the community dialogue on equity issues, engaging nearly 100 partners and 3,500 of our neighbors in its 21 day challenge last fall. The incredible response we've seen is further evidence of this business community doing the work needed to create more equitable and welcoming workplaces and create more and better opportunities for all who do and will call Central New York home. But these efforts alone are not sufficient and they are only a start. We cannot break the cycles and systems created over generations if only a handful of companies believe in and commit to this important work. And so I call on each of you to dig even deeper. On Monday, with support from Berkshire Bank, we will officially launch a website designed to provide a new set of resources to assist businesses and organizational leaders in this journey. As part of those efforts, we ask you to commit to driving equity within Syracuse and Central New York inside your own organization by taking Central New York's Business Equity Pledge. This is at once an opportunity, but also a critical responsibility that we must bear if we want to call ourselves leaders. And for those of you who might still question the role of business in this space, let me assure you that at a time of deep, almost paralytic polarization within our country's political systems, it is you, it is us, it's business, is being looked to for leadership on the most pressing challenges facing not just our economy, but our society. In a new report, the 2021 Edelman uh, Trust Barometer, which surveyed more than 3,300 people between October and November of last year, 68% of respondents said they want business leaders to step up when the government isn't leading on social issues. Additionally, 86% said that CEOs must publicly speak out on issues like the pandemic, 
job automation, social issues, and local community issues. So whether you like it or not, the eyes of the community, the country, and the world are increasingly trained on corporations and corporate leaders, and we will be held accountable for our actions or lack thereof. Well, there's a business case to be made for addressing issues of inequality also. According to a 2018 study funded by the Kellogg Foundation, author Ani Turner found that the US economy could be $8 trillion larger by 2050 if the country eliminated racial disparities in health, education, incarceration, and employment. Furthermore, if average incomes of minorities were equal to whites, it would represent a 12% increase in US earnings or nearly $1 trillion. Corporate profits would increase by 180 billion. Because the percentage of workforce that is minority is growing, closing the earnings gap by 2030 would increase GDP by 16% and increase corporate profits by $450 billion. Now, this past year has challenged us like no one. It has shown us unexpected hardships and even tragedy, but it has also shown us hope. It's reminded us of the most important things in life, community, family, and supporting each other however and wherever we're able. It's made us stronger. I've seen what this community is capable of and how we react when the chips are down. We didn't become resilient because of this health and economic crisis. We always have been. We're Central New Yorkers. We're the epitome of grit personified with a plan to advance our economy, with a stronger and more intentional focus on equity and prosperity for all. Let us leave here today and take the next step, not towards the past, but towards the future we have always envisioned for ourselves. Thank you for your support and commitment to this path forward. Have a great day. Thank you, Rob. You know, we see the challenges and opportunities before us, and we know that we all have work to do. But what is abundantly clear is that we have the resilience and the determination to ensure this work continues and the resolve to keep our community moving forward. So in the words of a great human being and leader, Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. Have a beautiful and great day and we will keep planning the work and working the plan. Thank you, Gary Keith, and thank all of you for joining us today. Please enjoy the rest of your day.